Starting on October 5th in New York, patients and caregivers registered with the state's Office of Cannabis Management can begin legally growing marijuana at home as part of the latest rules implemented by state regulators. To discuss this historic milestone in New York's medical marijuana program and consider the program landscape more broadly, we're joined on the Capitol Press Room by Timothy Mitchell, a medical marijuana patient and advocate. Welcome to the show, Tim. Hi, thank you so much for having me. So I guess for starters, why is the availability of home grow, the ability to grow marijuana at home, important to medical marijuana patients and their caregivers? So home cultivation is important to patients and caregivers because compared to other states where their medical programs are much stronger, um, a lot of them will actually already start with home cultivation rights in place. But the way our Compassionate Care Act was enacted, home cultivation was not allowed. And as uh, Governor Cuomo at the time kind of set up the program, it was one of the more restrictive programs in the state. So home cultivation is extremely important to us because the medical program in general is still relatively restrictive. We've seen some evolution, positive evolution uh, over the years, but there's still a lot of areas for improvement. And one of them is variety. Basically, a patient should be able to consistently access the medicine that works the best for them. And because of how restrictive our program is, how limited the competition is, you know, there's not much variety. And then price is also a big concern. When patients are able to cultivate their own, they're able to save a lot more money. Well, you mentioned this idea that the medical marijuana program, since its origin in New York, has been restrictive, and the rules that we're seeing now are not without their limitations. For example, there's uh, restrictions on the number of mature and immature plants that patients, as well as their caregivers, can uh, have. Do those types of limitations make sense to you? In my time as an advocate, I've kind of become a little bit more aware of how regulations and regulators have to kind of navigate. So I, there's a part of me that understands where they might want to limit plant counts for patients and caregivers. But for us especially, because of the nature of our medical use, it, it's entirely possible that a person may need at any given time, you know, anywhere from six to 12 different strains available to treat the various ailments because what might work for something like insomnia may not work for, you know, middle of the day pain. So some patients might need to have more than the allotted six or 12, depending on how many adults are in the household to really make their medical needs met. And especially with just one, like if I was in a single person household, I'm only allowed six, but of those six, three are immature and three are mature. So at any given time, I'm only able to have three plants, you know, coming closer to harvest and being readily accessible. When you think of the range of medical marijuana patients that are out there, both in terms of their needs when it comes to medical marijuana and their wherewithal or or interest uh, of growing themselves, how expansive do you think the use of these regs will be? Do you imagine a lot of medical marijuana patients w- will start growing, or will this represent just a, a small fraction uh, of the eligible patients uh, who start growing? Honestly, I, I I think we could easily accept like up to fifty percent as of like an early mm-hmm. metric or projection. I think as people learn from others and see that, you know, it's not rocket science, but there's definitely some art to it and there's a learning curve. I think we might see more patients start doing it or more patients will be inclined to try and find a caregiver who's able to grow medicine for them. Should regulators be focused at all on policing 
this area because there are, like we said, restrictions on how many plants that can be grown and maybe the state has a vested interest in ensuring that uh, people are using the product as they're supposed to, like uh, patients are consuming it and not you know, selling it off to other people or, or giving it away. Do you think the state has a vested interest in those different avenues or you know, would you like to see our uh, time and energy used elsewhere? I don't think that would be a good use of uh, New York State OCM resources. Um, I honestly don't really expect too much enforcement for patients. I think if they were to, if there were going to be reports of people registering as patients in name only, which that that is kind of a concept thrown around in some other states, some people might registered just so that they have that medical card cover to be able to grow a certain amount, which I think that it's a possibility everywhere in every state. And I think probably the, the plant cap that New York has done, it's probably based out of some feedback from other states where they might say, you know, you better keep an eye on caregiver grows because, you know, we have a heck of a time trying to, you know, limit how much they're cultivating and how much they might be directing elsewhere. But from a practical standpoint and from a safe access standpoint, medical patients need this ability because as of right now, 18 months after the MRTA has passed, our medical retail locations have not increased. The distance between a lot of dispensaries and patients has not you know, closed in to being much closer. So this is really about enabling our safe access and giving us control over the medicine that we want to put into our bodies. For listeners just joining us, you're listening to the Capitol Press Room, and we're shining a grow light on the state's medical marijuana program, which will allow for patients and caregivers to start cultivating cannabis plants on October 5th. And we're talking about this development as well as the program more broadly with Tim Mitchell, a medical marijuana patient and advocate. Rewinding then to the beginning of this process, what is it like now to actually get a medical marijuana prescription? And how does that compare to, say, the launch of this program when the list of conditions that were eligible and who could write a prescription was heavily restricted. So I think, especially in the last few years with the pandemic, having everybody doing telehealth for things, I think a lot more people have just kind of jumped both feet in with just doing telehealth recommendations. I know in the earliest days, it it was really just kind of the bricks and mortar physician offices that were probably able to write the recommendations, which again, that's, it's technically not even referred to as a prescription because of the federal prohibition layer. Uh, Physicians have to basically call it a recommendation because they can't prescribe a schedule one substance. And well, thinking about the conditions that are now eligible for a doctor to issue a recommendation, does the list of conditions match with all the different circumstances in which a New Yorker might benefit from medical marijuana, or is there more to do on that front as well? So it's definitely gotten much easier for people with uh, varying conditions that were, that, you know, extend beyond what was on the initial diagnosis list. I think where newer patients or people considering becoming patients might be surprised is that a lot of the the doctors that we're still seeing in person, a lot of them are seem to be resistant to becoming certified. I know uh, in my experience, my personal doctor, it kind of seems like there's like this thinking that, you know, I don't want to become the pot doctor kind of thing. Um, even though they, my physician knows and just how many fewer medications I take on a yearly basis because of my mindful medical use of cannabis, it's 
it's just not enough to really get her excited enough to become a recommending physician. So I think a lot of newer patients are probably surprised that they have to resort to telehealth. I know some people will like ask around to be like, hey, do you think this is legitimate? Because it, it kind of seems too good to be true. But I can say I've never done an in-person recommendation. All of mine have always been through telehealth providers. And for me, that works because there's a lot of trial and error when it comes to medical use too, which you don't necessarily always have to be checking in with your doctor to report back and try and get guidance. It, it's just, you need to test different uh, forms and strains to see how your body reacts. If it's something that, you know, seems to do or check all the boxes for symptom relief. So I think it, in general, it, it remains pretty easy, but I think sometimes people are surprised that they can't just get a recommendation as part of their 30 or $40 copay. A lot of people just kind of resort to the telehealth services, which can range. Lately, I've been seeing sometimes if you kind of strike at the right time, people can get a recommendation for as low as like probably 85 or $90. But I would say the average nowadays is still, you know, 99 to 149 for a yearly recommendation. And at the bottom half of the hour, we'll be back with more from Tim Mitchell, a medical marijuana patient and consumer advocate. When we get back, we'll consider the landscape of medical marijuana dispensaries and the cost of the products they're selling and how the recreational market will impact all of this. Don't go anywhere. Support for the Capitol Press Room is provided by New York State United Teachers, a union of professionals in education, human services, and health care. For listeners just joining us, you're listening to the Capitol Press Room, and we're shining a grow light on the state's medical marijuana program, which will allow for patients and caregivers to start cultivating cannabis plants on October 5th. And we're talking about this development as well as the program more broadly with Tim Mitchell, a medical marijuana patient and advocate. So turning to that issue, though, that you highlight about the landscape of dispensaries for medical marijuana patients in New York, can you expand a little bit on what that landscape looked prior to the passage of the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act in 2021 and what there were in terms of expectations moving forward for the launch of more dispensaries and how that expectation is compared with the subsequent reality? Leading up to the passage of the MRTA, some listeners may remember it wasn't that long before COVID-19 came into the picture. And a lot of patients were dealing with the fact that we wanted access to whole flour And people were arguing for that because there was an issue with vape cartridges that were basically contaminated with vitamin E oil that certain legacy market people were adding into it. And that obviously created kind of a bit of a health crisis because at first nobody knew what the heck it was. And when it really landed in New York State, that's when I first kind of really became active in this space trying to get the program to expand and year after year the focus has always been on we want to pass the mrta because it's the better bill which i I can definitely agree that it was definitely better than the expansion bills that were kind of hanging out in the wings but as year after year passed and the mrta never crossed the finish line a lot of patients were kind of you know, left wondering, well, what about us? Why are none of these expansions happening when the MRTA can't seem to be passed? So leading up to the MRTA passing, we had, I want to say, 38 dispensaries because two of the registered organizations or ROs, as a lot of us call them, is 
only operating three retail locations, whereas their license would allow them to have up to four right now. As of right now, after the passage of the MRTA, we still only have 38. Now, it did take some time after the MRTA was passed and the Cannabis Control Board was set up. But one of the big things that patients were waiting with bated breath on was the availability of whole flour, because for quite a long time, we the best we could really get was ground flour, which was not really what most patients wanted. So we did get that. I believe it was actually at the first Cannabis Control Board meeting, which that was a relief for a lot of us. But I think a lot of us have been a little bit discouraged because the focus has been on all of the adult use program rollouts. So the other component here, though, is the actual cost of the product at these dispensaries. Has there been any change in the product cost at these dispensaries, which, like you say, have not uh, dramatically increased in availability? So I first became a patient back in, I believe it was 2016, 2017. I would say since then and over time, I think we've seen some prices come down a little bit, but they're still at levels that are just not realistic for a lot of people. Even at middle-class income levels, it can still be a challenge because depending on your needs, you may have a, a lot of needs that you need to stock up on, you know, this type of inhaled medicine, this type of oral medicine. So the costs have kind of stayed relatively stable. And as an ongoing thing for certain patients, like people that have limited uh, income, they're veterans. Um, I think there might be a couple other different discount types that are kind of offered on an ongoing basis. But those discounts don't really extend to as many people as I think a lot of patients would like to see. One thing I can say that has improved since uh, the MRTA passed is that I think in preparation of the adult use market and the ability that the registered organizations will eventually be able to enter it, I think they're starting to really compete with each other on price and promotions and stuff. So where, say two years ago, we never used to see certain registered organizations offering semi-weekly deals, monthly deals. Now we're starting to see certain ROs will have weekly strains that are available at a discount. We'll see patient appreciation days held where, you know, it might be a whole weekend stretch of time where there's a larger discount available to anyone. And really the only thing you have to do is just show up during that sale event. If you're paying close attention to the promotions coming into your email and maybe social media ads, you're able to kind of identify when the best time is to strike to get your medicine. But the big problem with that is it only benefits the patients that have reliable transportation on basically kind of a moment's notice or, and or they have to have the financial resources ready and available to use because cannabis is a cash business. We can't use credit. So for a lot of patients who are of limited income or don't have transportation, they're probably seeing all these ads that would really help them meet their medical needs every month, but they have no way of getting there. A, a sad side effect of them preparing for the adult use market is that some of the companies have started cutting back and or eliminating their delivery programs, which was honestly a lifeline for a lot of patients. It's really a mixed bag. I feel like kind of the baseline prices have only really come down a little bit, but where there's been benefit for us is that companies are actively competing because they want the market share, but it's only benefiting a certain segment of the patient community. For listeners just joining us, you're listening to the Capitol Press Room, and we're shining a grow light on the state's medical marijuana program, which will allow for patients and caregivers to start cultivating cannabis plants on October 5th. 
and we're talking about this development as well as the program more broadly with Tim Mitchell, a medical marijuana patient and advocate. Do you anticipate that once the recreational market is open, that some of the medical patients will gravitate towards the recreational market, either because of the products that are available or because of cost or just because of the location of where retail dispensaries might pop up? So that that is kind of a, a issue where I would love to be able to see some kind of improvement or changes occurring at the Office of Cannabis Management because as it stands right now, medical patients don't appear to have the ability to walk into an adult use shop or uh, the first dispensaries that we're going to be opening are the conditional adult use retail dispensaries. Nobody, there's been no talk of allowing medical patients with their cards to go to one of these retail stores and be able to make a purchase and not have all the adult use taxes applied, which some people may not be aware. New York, on top of kind of the local taxes, they also have a THC tax, which honestly, I've never been that big on, you know, math and stuff. So it's hard for me to kind of like conceptualize how I would really be estimating the price for myself trying to go to a uh, adult use store because each strain or batch is going to have a different potency level and realistically we're not going to be able to always anticipate what those additional things are going to be i think for patients trying to shop at adult use retail dispensaries it's not going to work in our favor i think if we're not able to make those purchases without the taxes, you know, the taxes are definitely going to be further crippling for us. I do definitely want to see some of the, the adult use licensees that come on board offer the variety. And I want, I would love to see a lot of that variety come into the medical dispensaries, but the way the laws and regulations are built, it's hard to see how any of these newer licensees will be able to do that because at this point in time, it really kind of looks like the patient community is going to be restricted to these large vertically integrated registered organizations. And they, they only kind of go so far in their offerings right now. Well, finally, if you were, the head of the state's Office of Cannabis Management and could do one regulation that you thought would be important for medical marijuana consumers, or if you uh, were in charge of the legislature and the executive and could implement one new law, what would it be? What, where would you strike that you think could have the biggest difference uh, in improving the lives of medical marijuana patients? To be honest, I think that the one thing I would do is push to have a division of medical cannabis affairs or something similar within the Office of Cannabis Management. I know in the few years leading up to the MRTA, that was something that I used to write to DOH a lot about, that there there is no patient advocate, uh, especially like during those yearly budget hearings where in my mind, I kind of wanted to see a DOH representative representing patients to be like, hey, if you guys aren't going to pass the CRTA or MRTA, which everyone happens to be the closest to being passed, we need to take those bills off the table and we have to move forward with medical expansion because medical patient needs are not being met. And I think even now, I think that's even more important because back in the spring, there was a period where there was some kind of IT issues going on and patients would receive a recommendation from a provider. And for some reason, the registration site where patients are able to get their accounts set up, they're able to get their cards. For whatever reason, the process would just kind of freeze at a certain point and they wouldn't be able to get their cards. And unfortunately, the cards are required to walk into a dispensary to make a purchase. So there were a lot of patients who were very, very angry with the Office of Cannabis Management because some of these patients were waiting in excess of 45 days with a valid recommendation to get their medication. And it was all because of kind of like computer glitches, which 
happened to kind of coincide when they started running social media ads. And I think there was a NCAA Final Four commercial that they aired, which I, I can't imagine that was on the cheaper side. Mm-hmm. I think the one thing I would change is having some kind of medical cannabis advisory body within the Office of Cannabis Management to make sure that the impact of changes are not, you know, just further kind of putting patients down or cutting off their options. I just, it's been kind of a long time observation that within the offices that are managing cannabis, whether it's Department of Health or Office of Cannabis Management, it kind of seems like patient affairs are the very last thing that anybody notices. And it's only really when we're able to somehow get the media to report on it, which honestly, that has been a challenge over time as well. Well, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, We've been speaking with Timothy Mitchell. He's a medical marijuana patient and advocate. Tim, thank you so much for making the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Is your business, agency, or service interested in delivering your message to more than two dozen radio stations statewide carrying Capital Press Room? If so, visit capitalpressroom.org to contact our underwriting team.